see if I can pronounce this correctly. Wapiti Energy. Wapiti. Judge Wiener has corrected me. Not for, so not for the first time. Wapiti Energy, the Clear Spring Property and Casualty Company. That's the name of an elk. The name of an elk? Yes. Is that right? Okay. We take judicial notice. <laughs> Large elk. That's what you get for having a hunter. <laughs> I always love having a hunter on the panel. All right, Miss Rankemeyer. Ah, oh, over two. I think, um, grammatically, yours is probably more correct. So okay. Okay, <laughs> Miss Rankemeyer, welcome. Step right up. Take it away. Good afternoon. May it please the court. My name is Megan Rinkemeyer, and I am here on behalf of the appellant Wapiti Energy LLC. The removal of a 155-foot barge laden with approximately 6,000 barrels of crude oil from where it was grounded following Hurricane Ida was compulsory by law. I would like to highlight a few points which are important to the analysis of whether removal of this barge was compulsory by law. First, non-negligent vessel owners may be held legally liable for removing their vessels from the third, a third party's immovable property or from a navigable waterway. We contend that Wapiti faced a reasonable concern of exposure to legal liability to both a third party and to the government in this case by reason of the SMI 315's location following Hurricane Ida. <clears throat> A reasonable expectation of legal liability under either Louisiana or federal law would establish that removal of the barge in this case was compulsory by law. Second, the expense of removal was justified in this case because legal liability to Wapiti under either Louisiana law or federal law would have included that Wapiti assume the expense of removal. Next, in tear off, we feel is in line with Louisiana codal and jurisprudential authorities regarding the right of an owner of a movable property to enjoy peaceful possession of their property. And finally, we would offer that interpretation of what constitutes an obstruction to navigation under the REC Act has been and should be broad to meet the goal of the Rivers and Harbors Act to prevent obstruction of the nation's waterways. In continental oil, we spoke of uh, legal duty. That's the phrase we used. And as precisely as you can muster, when specifically did the legal duty here arise, first arise, to remove this vessel? Was it the moment it ran aground? Was it later when Conoco Phillips was on notice that the vessel was on its property? Was it later when Conoco Phillips? made noises about litigation, when specifically did the duty to remove the vessel arise? Your Honor, I would argue that the duty arose immediately. Um, Wapiti knew... The moment that it ran aground. Correct, Your Honor. Wapiti knew from the moment it became aware of this vessel's location that it was not on Wapiti's property. We knew it was on a third party's property. And yes, we later discovered the identity of that third party, but I think knowledge that it's no longer where it's supposed to be and is in fact on the property of a third party was sufficient for Wapiti to reasonably anticipate that that third party would not want an abandoned barge on their property. Is there any evidence in the record that the vessel was in fact interfering with ConocoPhillips' enjoyment of the marshland? Your Honor, I don't believe that there is evidence in the record that the barge was actively interfering with Conoco's enjoyment of its property. However, what is in the record is that Conoco was aware that this, became aware that this barge was on its property, which suggests that Conoco had a generalized awareness of what was and was not on the property. And further, I'm not sure that 
there is a requirement of interference under Louisiana law, which would entitle, well, maybe I say that incorrectly, but I don't think an act of interference is what is required of a disturbance in fact. I think that under a proper reading of what would constitute a disturbance of in fact, an abandoned barge would be that. Would be what, I'm sorry? A disturbance in fact of ConocoPhillips in peaceful possession of its property. Your Honor, now turning to um, the, one of the central issues in this appeal as to whether or not this marine package provides coverage, um, we contend that the wreck removal provision um, in this case clearly applies. We, we believe this is a wreck removal case under the PNI policy. Um, there is no dispute that the SMI 315 was a scheduled vessel under the property. Um, and further, we contend that the SMI 315 following its grounding constituted a wrecked vessel. After Hurricane Ida, the vessel could not operate normally. It, it required more than a simple towing to remove it from the property. In fact, she had to be lightered, which there is evidence in the record that that was required prior to any movement of the vessel. And then pulling power was required to remove her from the position she was in that was hard aground. Um, further, on October 18th of 2021, this vessel was unilaterally declared a constructive total loss by Clear Spring. Ultimately, the vessel could not be returned to service and was scrapped. Let me ask you uh, this. Uh, do you agree or disagree that uh, the law of the state uh, where the marine insurance contract was issued and delivered is a governing law. For purposes of whether or not removal was compulsory by law? Compulsory. I, I believe that the governing law as to that question is federal maritime law um, because it has been decided, and this is a, a, a federal maritime contract policy, and so I believe that the interpretation provided by this and other courts under well, fair- Is that what Progress Marine says? Progress, Your Honor, I have to admit that I, I don't know offhand Progress Marine's statement on that point. Uh, Progress Marine versus Foremost Insurance. Yes, sir. Uh, well, we, we said in that case that uh, the uh, interpretation of the phrase compulsory by law in marine protection and indemnity policies uh, that, uh, that that we would be compulsory by law be interpreted uh, by its plain meaning and uh, when the owner uh, uh, vessel uh, removes to avoid criminal penalties. Yes, Your Honor. I, I think that I think my understanding of the reading and progress for me, Marine, as clarified by this court in Bonanza, and that has been applied since in the Danos matter, um, is that the potential for legal liability there would be both civil or criminal, um, and not just limited to a criminal penalty. What do we do if there's ever a situation where general maritime law? conflicts with state law on whether there's a duty to remove a vessel. I'm not saying there's a conflict here, but what is a court like us to do if general maritime law does collide with state law? My belief on that is that maritime law would control in that instance because the goals of maritime law are a uniformity right. in the sort of law applied across all of these vessels regardless of you know which state's waters they are closest to um so your position of course is that louisiana law requires the removal of the barge from conica phillips property but we said in continental oil that at least as a matter of general maritime law quote a non-negligent owner is not personally liable for the cost of a sunken vessel. Um, that, 
That's correct, Your Honor. Continental Oil, the Bonanza matter, involved the potential for legal liability under the REC Act um, due to the sunken nature of the vessel. Um, this court, um, Continental Oil, I believe, was in decided in 1983. In 1986, Congress amended the REC Act. It removed the words voluntarily and carelessly, which this court addressed in the NRA Southern Scrap case, I believe, um, subsequent to those amendments, and said that that is no longer the case. Now a non-negligent vessel owner under this court's reading of the REC Act can be legally liable for the removal of the vessel. Uh, you mentioned in response to Judge Weiner that, uh, yes, there's an obvious federal, federal interest in keeping maritime law uniform, keeping it consistent. Um, nobody disputes that. So do you see any potential problems with relying on state law for this compulsory by law question? I do not think that state law requiring removal of the vessel in this instance would conflict with the maritime law. I think the goals of both are served by the removal of this vessel from where it was stranded following Hurricane Ida. In fact, I think maritime law would encourage removal of this vessel such that there would be no conflict. Say, say we agree with you on step one, that state law can be law that compels Wapiti to remove the vessel. Did I say that right, Wapiti? Yes, sir. Okay, so we're, say we spot you step one. State law can be law that requires removal. Um, the tension, I think, is over whether state law actually does compel Wapiti to well, remove the vessel. Follow up on uh, the judge's question. Uh, is this one that we should certify to the Louisiana Supreme Court? Your Honor, while I, we do not present a Louisiana Supreme Court directly on point, I think the principles, um, as stated in the Terrell case, which we also see with respect to a different um, disturbance of a movable property in the Allen v. Smith case regarding a tree following a hurricane, I, um, I think that is well-founded within Louisiana law, um, such that I think that this court is in a position to take the law of Louisiana, which protects immovable property owners from disturbances, and apply it here, um, and, and such that an abandoned barge is a disturbance to the possession of this property. It's not in navigable waters. Your Honor, we contend that it was in partially in a navigable waterway, but it was partially in Batiste Bay. If you look at the photographs in the record, um, which I believe are around 193, you can see um, that half of this barge was on, was hard aground on the physical property of Conoco Phillips. The other half of this barge was hanging off into Batiste Bay, which is why we also contend that Wapiti was reasonably, reasonably anticipated exposure to liability under the REC Act, that this, this vessel endangered navigation in the manner in which it was found following Hurricane Ida. So distill for me, again, as convincingly as you can, the argument that Louisiana law clearly imposes a duty to remove the vessel. Louisiana law clearly imposes a duty on the owners of a movable, prop movable property to remove that movable from another's immovable property because Louisiana law protects the owner of immovable property from disturbances in fact, which under the case law can be a myriad of things. However, this 150-foot barge so qualifies. Your Honor, um, turning, turning now since I, I just have a few minutes, our position is that removal of the SMI 315 following hur Hurricane Ida is covered under the REC, removal clause in the PNI policy. We would request that this court reverse the district court's judgment holding the removal was not compulsory by law and, in, and render judgment that REC removal costs were covered under the policy. Alternatively, we would request this, court, this case be remanded for further proceedings in the district court. Um, we believe if this court finds that the REC removal clause provides coverage herein, the court can end its analysis there. 
Um, however, if there is an analysis as to the applicability of the sue and labor clause, we contend that the trial court's judgment should be reversed and remanded on that issue. Um, briefly, if this is not rec removal, we believe issues remain as to whether Wapiti's actions, which began prior to any declaration of constructive total loss, were that of sue and labor and served to minimize the exposure to clear spring. In the event Wapiti's actions were found to be sue and labor and not rec removal, the constructive total loss declaration should not preclude coverage under that clause. And I'm happy to address any questions on that point, or I will save the rest for rebuttal. Okay. Ms. Reckemeyer, thanks. We'll see you back on rebuttal. So, Mr. Kozad or Kozad? Kozad, Your Honor. Mr. Kozad, welcome. But I answer to many other things, believe me. Welcome. Uh, Richard Kozad for Clear Spring Insurance, uh, appellee and defendant. Uh, Your Honors, I'm fighting a cold and I'm losing my voice, so I'll be briefer than usual. I'll be happy to answer any questions you all may have. Uh, I guess to answer one of your initial questions, Judge Willett, uh, the only demand that Wapiti ever made in this case was, as you noted, some noise back in mid-September, basically asking uh, Wapiti, Conoco asking Wapiti, is this your barge on our land? Wapiti said, yes, it is our barge on your land, and we're working to remove it. Uh, the next noise was sometime in mid-December of 21, and then in January of 22, when Conoco said, hey, there's this indentation in our marsh, uh, can you guys do something about it? And all you need to do is put some mangrove swamp, mangroves down, and some marsh grass, and some mud, and that should do it. And in our experience, that costs fifteen to twenty-five thousand dollars, but it may be more. That is the extent of of Conoco's demands upon Wapiti. Why? Why? Would, even up until this day. Why wouldn't restoring the marsh necessarily mean removing the barge? Because that is, that is the legal claim that Conoco has. The only damage that Conoco has sustained was the indentation in the marsh. That's it, Your Honor. The landowner didn't even care. Your Honor? The landowner didn't even care that it was there. It didn't, it, it, as I said, Your Honor, even up until today, as far as I know, Conoco has not made any further demand upon Wapiti to restore the marsh in any respect. Uh, no demand letters. If I no. understand the argument by your friends on the other side, it's that in addition to that, they also have the complaint about the disturbance of peaceful possession of their land. What's your response to that argument? In addition to the indentation, they also have the the, the, the disturbance of the peaceful possession of their land. Your Honor, there is nothing in the record, nor is there any communication from Conoco talking about a disturbance of their peaceful possession of the land. That is an argument that has been advanced by Wapiti here, but certainly not Conoco. And, and let me just address that for a minute. Just so I'm clear, the cost of restoring the marsh, in your view, doesn't include the cost of removing the barge? No, because as I think the Fifth Circuit as, as this court in the en banc opinion, the Bonanza case, said that we look at legal liability. And the legal liability here is Conoco's claim for the damage to its property. Conoco did not incur any expense in removing the barge. That is exclusively Wapiti, which it did on its own. The only legal claim Conoco has here is restoration of the marsh, which they have not pursued. If there's... If there's something or someone trespassing on land, would you say that that something or someone is disturbing the possession of the land, even if the landowner is unaware of the trespass? No. And, and let's, let's talk about, and I think Judge Douglas, you brought the point about possession. Um, even if, and let me digress a little bit more about what law applies, because this is a case involving interpretation of a policy of marine insurance. Since the 1800s, 
U.S. Supreme Court, and I'm sorry I didn't put it in the brief because I thought it was undisputed that the federal maritime law governs interpretation of marine insurance policies, and I can certainly supply that to the court as soon as I get back to the office. The United States Supreme Court case. And Your Honor, I'm losing my voice. <clears throat> uh, this is a standard provision in a protection indemnity policy wreck removal. It has been interpreted innumerable times by the federal courts, and I would have to say is an entrenched principle of the general maritime law. It is not subject to interpretation by, by the various state, uh, state uh, 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 courts. Um, but getting back to the question about possession, I think which Judge Douglas asked, certainly, certainly as in the Tara Buff case, uh, which was a state court decision, which Judge Ellison referenced in his, in his decision uh, at the district court level, uh, that court found that there was no negligence on the part of the vessel owner, that even though, even though the vessel was in a position to march roughly 1,000 feet from a navigable channel, it was not a wreck act case. The only relief that was granted uh, in that case was that because under pursuant to Louisiana state law, the, the Louisiana appellate court held the possessory action did, a, <clears throat> did apply. And pursuant to that, the, the barge owner was obliged to remove the barge uh, at its own expense. But again, the court in Terra Buff was careful to say the only damage claim that the property owner had in that instance was for damage to their property not for the cost of removal of the barge because they didn't incur those costs. You say um, in your red brief <clears throat> that Wapiti wasn't compelled by law to remove the vessel because, you put it this way, because no claim from Conoco ever materialized. In Continental Oil, we talked about whether there was a legal duty or whether a legal duty existed. And can't a legal duty exist without the threat of litigation? I mean, we, we say that all the time in tort law. I agree, Your Honor, but I think we need to make a distinction here because we're looking, this has to fit within the template of the obligation to reinsure pursuant to their duty under the wreck removal clause. It's not any legal obligation. I think Judge Brown in the Progress Marine case, made that distinction. He says on page A21, on the other hand, we are not prepared to say that removal occasioned by any legal obligation is compulsory by law, as PMI would seem to suggest. So they're not coterminous. They're not interchangeable. Legal obligation is not interchangeable with compulsory by law because compulsory by law is a legal interpretation of a revision in insurance policy. So just because there may be a legal obligation doesn't mean that comports with compulsory by law for purposes of the wreck removal provision of this insurance policy. Moving on to the REC Act, Your Honor, I think Judge Ellison made it very clear. And I have to say, Judge Ellison's opinion was short, succinct, and I think to the point. Judge Ellison found that in accordance with the, with the Bonanza case, that insofar as the circumstances, the facts of this case existed, it did not present, it did not meet the template established by the Bonanza to be compulsory by law because, as Judge Ellison noted, the test in Bonanza, which remains the test today, is that it extends to a legal duty imposed either by statute or general maritime law even including those duties for whose non-performance of sanctions a payment of damages to persons injured. And again, the only person injured here is Conoco, and the only injury is the damage to their property for which they have made no claim. And this is, this is even more significant. Even thus, interpret the policy nonetheless extends only to a duty to remove imposed by law. Such a duty must be present and unconditional, not remote and contingent. And Judge Ellison found that in these circumstances, in this case, the potential liability of Wapiti to Conoco was not present and unconditional, but remote and contingent. And for that reason, 
looking at the law, looking at the facts, and looking at the interpretation of the insurance policy, Judge Ellison found that this case simply did not meet the standard uh, required by the courts to impose a duty upon Wapiti uh, to move the barge pursuant to the REC Act provision of the insurance policy. Um, and moving on to the REC Act argument, Your Honor, uh, uh, Judge Ellison quickly dispensed with that because looking at the language of the REC Act, it clearly says navigable channel. Navigable channel, not navigable waterway. And I think if you look at the photographs of the barge, particularly the photograph which is in the record on uh, page 196, you will see that this barge rests almost entirely on land. And it's not, in, in Barataria Bay, it's just that, an open bay, not an adequate channel. In all the cases, I reviewed all the cases cited by Wapiti in support of the REC Act, and all of them invariably involve a situation where a vessel was out of the sink uh, by a shipyard, by a marina, in a river, or in the Danos case where the party stipulated that the RAC Act applied, which we certainly don't stipulate to here. Uh, finally, Your Honor, uh, uh, as to sue and labor, uh, this is clearly not a sue and labor case. I mean, sue and labor, as we laid out in our brief, and I think as, as, as Wapiti concedes, only exists in those situations where the policyholder, the insured, undertakes efforts to preserve the hull so that it may save the underwriter some money. That was situ simply not the situation here. Within five days, well, actually, yeah, the adjuster got the scene on, April, on September 10th, realized right away that this was a constructive total loss case and that there was no student labor obligation involved in such a situation. And underwriters agreed to pay Wapiti the, the full, val full scheduled value of the barge. Um, so unless your honors have any more questions for me, I'll, uh, I'll stand down. Okay, thank you very much. Ms. Rickemeyer, you've got a whopping five minutes. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I want to start with respect to the question on compulsory by law that was posed to Mr. Kozad. Um, the compulsory by law test looks at what a reasonable insured would do under the circumstances. In fact, Removal of a wreck is, of a vessel is compulsory by law when a reasonable owner fully informed would conclude that the failure to remove the vessel would expose him to liability sufficiently great an amount and probability of occurrence to justify the expense of removal. That is how the express clause in this insurance policy has been interpreted by the court. So looking at what a reasonable insured would do when faced with a 155-foot barge that they owned, heavily laden with crude oil, sitting partially on sensitive marshland of a third party and partially in a navigable waterway, I suggest the answer is they would undertake immediate efforts to remove it. It would be unreasonable under the law to presume that they could simply abandon it. And in fact, in cases in which such barges have been abandoned, we see that in Tear All, where the state court ordered the barge owner to remove the vessel. We also see that under the REC Act, where now the non-negligent vessel owner can be held liable for the removal costs. What is the effect of the landowners don't give a damn? To me, that is impossible to know in a way. Maybe Conoco Phillips did not threaten litigation, so to speak, but they certainly asked that the barge be removed. And Wapiti, in the face of that request, removed the barge. So to say that they didn't care that the barge was out there leaps over that fact and pretends as if the barge is still there today. It's not. I think we cannot speculate how that landowner would feel if that barge had never been removed. Um, and, and further, I think what it, it's, it's the physical dispossession of a portion of their property which is sufficient under the law to be a disturbance in fact. Um, and so I think what the, the vessel owner has to focus on is, is what they know and what Wapiti knew 
is that barge was on a third party's property and partially in a navigable waterway. There was no dispute it was loaded with oil. There was no dispute that it was hard aground but unmoored and could be subsequently moved again. Had, I mean, if we had a Katrina Rita situation or a Laura Delta situation, there are many, many possibilities here, but focusing on what a reasonable insured would do informed solely with what was before them, I would posit that they would remove their barge or, or know that they would face the consequence of not. Um, <clears throat> I would offer in this case that Clear Spring does not seem to dispute that this policy would have recovered, would have covered removal of a wrecked vessel. Rather, they take issue with the fact that Wapiti was proactive in removing that vessel. And, and we would argue that the policies would encourage vessel owners to take those proactive steps so that the liability exposure does not increase exponentially um, and that such should be encouraged and these vessels should not be allowed to simply remain where they land following hurricanes. If the court has no questions, I would cede the rest of my time and thank y'all. All right, we appreciate it. Thank you both. The case is submitted and that's our last case for today. And we'll stand in recess until one o'clock tomorrow afternoon.